Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So, in this talk and the following two talks, we will be discussing the proofs in Indian mathematical tradition. So, in this talk, we will be talking about uh, the history of proofs and the idea of upapatti as they are called in Indian mathematical works, where are they present and something on what is the understanding of Indian mathematicians as to what an upapatti, uh, what is the purpose, what it ought to do or what it purports to do. Then we will study few examples of proofs uh, in the earlier Indian texts and come to of course, the text Yukti Bhasha, which is indeed a collection of proofs. Many of these proofs of Yukti Bhasha will be discussed in the second and the third lecture and at the end of which we will try to analyze what is the notion of proof in Indian mathematics once again towards the end. Now, uh, while a considerable amount of information is known about Indian mathematics and it has been known for a fairly long time to modern scholars, uh, there has not been really that much discussion on uh, what is the understanding. Uh, of Indian mathematicians about the nature of mathematics, uh, what does mathematics deal with, uh, what it is supposed to do or have Indian philosophers discussed these questions. So, these kind of issues have not been uh, studied or analyzed in uh, any detail. The reason is because we have been so sort of impressed by the achievements of the Indian mathematicians that they did these very nice results, Aryabhata had this beautiful approximation per square root uh, of the pi or he had this very nice method per square root cube root or Brahmagupta came up with this wonderful formula for the diagonals of a cyclic quadrilateral or we have this Chakravala. So, these results and achievements of Indian mathematicians occupied a considerable amount of our uh, time in the study and the original works therefore, were, were uh, scanned for the kind of results that they had. And uh, we were not discussing how they were uh, arriving at these results or in what context they were they looking at these results. This did not become the subject of serious investigation. One is because the traditionally these issues have been dealt with in the commentaries. So, any text in India has to be understood along with its commentaries and along with the successive oral tradition of teaching of that text and that is what gives you the uh, an orientation towards uh, that text and its position in the overall uh, discipline that uh, uh, is being considered and the way this discipline has evolved. So, till very recent times writing of these commentaries was a very important part of uh, Indian uh, textual uh, Indian uh, scientific tradition or in all Shastras this was a very important thing and in the traditional scheme of learning this commentaries played a very very major role, but uh, we, since we have been disconnected from that way of studying Indian knowledge systems, we sort of most of the time just look at their results and then start wondering how did they arrive at it or did they have any method at all or did they not have any method at all. And we also start discussing things that may be Patanjali did not understand Panini correctly, may be uh, Haradatta did not understand Patanjali correctly like that. I mean obviously, nobody would have understood his predecessor so thoroughly that is indeed true, but if he did not understand there is no reason that we will be able to understand the predecessor much better. So, these are the kind of issues in which we are caught most of the time. So, if we are interested in understanding methodology of Indian mathematics, we have to look at the commentaries much more seriously and this will apply to most of other disciplines, most of other traditional Indian disciplines also. <coughs> now, when modern scholars started studying Indian mathematics. Uh, the fact that these books did have various kinds of proofs, the fact that there were commentaries and they contained various proofs was uh, taken note of. Colebrook's work is the pioneering work of uh, in the translation of Indian mathematical text, 
he translated Lilavati, he translated Bijaganita, he translated the two mathematics chapters of Brahma's Putta Siddhanta and Colebrook's book is filled with footnotes from various commentaries and occasionally he refers to the kind of demonstrations or upapattis which are contained in the commentaries. Colebrook says on the subject of demonstrations, it is to be remarked that the Hindu mathematicians proved propositions both algebraically and geometrically as is particularly noticed by Bhaskara himself towards the close of his algebra, where he gives both modes, of, both modes of proof of a remarkable method for the solution of the Bhavita problem he is referring to. Similarly, Charles Wish, whose article generated interest about the Kerala school of mathematics in recent times, this article was written in 1835. In fact, it was submitted as a first a paper to the Madras Literary Society and later on it was read as a paper in the uh, it was published in the transaction of Royal Asiatic Society. So, which says in his uh, article, he talks about four texts, uh, Tantra Sangraha, Yukti Bhasha, Karana Padati and Sadratnamala. <coughs> Except Karana Padati, now uh, all these uh, other texts have been fairly good editions and translations and explanations of these texts are currently available. So, a further account of Yukti Bhasha, the demonstrations of the rules for the quadrature of the circle by infinite series with the series for the sines, cosines and their demonstrations will be given in a separate paper. I shall therefore, conclude this, this paper that is the paper that he is presenting by submitting a simple and curious proof of the 47th proposition of Euclid, what is generally called the Pythagoras theorem extracted from the Yukti Bhasha, but uh, which did not write uh, any further paper. In fact, there is this detailed manuscript of Vish uh, of you, uh, this uh, Tantra Sangraha with Shankaravariya's Malayalam commentary is available uh, with his uh, detailed handwritten notes on one side of the book, which uh, Professor Ram Subramanian had an occasion to copy and they published some extracts from it on of uh, Shankaravariya's Malayalam commentary couple of years ago. <coughs> now, Vish's paper was widely noted at the time when it was written, it was written in 1835. So, this was considered an important discovery at that time. However, all this was soon forgotten and there was really no study of Yukti Bhasha for almost 110-120 years when C. T. Raj Gopal and his collaborators started uh, pioneering articles on proofs in Indian mathematics. And therefore, it is this uh, scant attention paid by modern scholarship of the last two centuries to this extensive, extensive tradition of commentaries it is this which has led to a lack of lack of comprehension of methodology of Indian mathematics. And this is often reflected in sort of bland statements that you will find in many of the general history books of mathematics. So, if you open any general history of mathematics, you are likely to come across a statement like this. This I have taken from Maurice Klein. It is a book of about 1000 pages, Mathematical Thought from Ancient to Modern Times. As our survey indicates, the Hindus were interested in and contributed to the arithmetical and computational activities of mathematics rather than to the deductive patterns. Their name for mathematics was Ganita, which means the science of calculation, which is of course correct. There is much good procedure and technical facility, but no evidence that they considered proof at all. They had rules, but apparently no logical scruples. Moreover, no general methods or viewpoint, new viewpoints were arrived at in any area. So, this is a kind of a, uh, a broad sweep generalization view of Indian mathematics. You will find this in several books. Now, the current books will write it with some more uh, sort of uh, caution and some more subordinate clauses added, but the overall thing will be that to a large extent the uh, way these results uh, were obtained by Indian mathematician still remain obscure or something like that will be the general content. So, uh, Amongst the published works, there are indeed several books which do contain these Upapattis. So, the first is the Bhashya uh, Bhaskara of Aryabhatiya. This contains a few discussions of proofs. The Bhashya of Govinda Swamin on Mahabhaskariya, the Vasana Bhashya of Prutudaka Swamin on Brahmasputta Siddhanta. This uh, commentary is still not published in entirety, only some sections are available in print. So, the first really book that is of serious uh, discussion of Upapattis is in the Vivarana of Bhaskaracharya on Shishyadivridhida Tantra of Lalla, the Vasana of Bhaskaracharya on his own Bijaganita, 
Devasana Bhaskaracharya on his own, Siddhanta Shiromani, these are indeed commentaries which contain extensive, extensive discussion of proofs. Parameshwara's commentary on uh, uh, Govinda Swamin's Bhashya, Nilakantha Sarya Bhatiya Bhashya, then of course, Yukti Bhashya of Jeshta Deva, Yukti Deepika and Kriya Kramakari of Shankaravarya, which we have referred to. Then uh, about 20 years ago, Professor K. V. Sharma published a large number of tracts, which were small monographs, which contained uh, discussions and uh, proofs of uh, small bits of results on various topics. So, he compiled them and published about 20 such tracts uh, 20, 30, 20, 25 years ago. Buddhi Vilasini of Ganesha Devagya, we have talked about Krishna Devagya's Bijanavankura also we have referred to. The Surya Dasa's commentary on Bijaganita also has Upapattis. Vasana Vartika on Dusimha Devagya is a super commentary on Bhaskaracharya's Vasana Bhashya, it is available in print. Marichiya Munishwara is another discussion of uh, Siddhanta Shiromani, which contains Upapatti. So, there are indeed a large number of books so, uh, which have been published. So, if one wants to find out how a particular result was proved, one should first go up and look the available commentaries. Of course, if the proof is not there, one has to search more or one has to look around more. First, because so much has been said about the lack of logical rigor and such thing about Indian mathematicians, we will be forced to sort of <laughs> give quotations where the Indian mathematicians do say that proving some results are indeed important. Uh, if we want to take a mathematical result seriously, a proof is indeed needed. So, here is Krishna Daivagya, who is writing it uh, somewhere in the beginning of his uh, Bijanavankura. He is saying, he is referring to the result, Varga Yogo Dvigna Ghatena Yuto Hinova Yuti Vargo Antara Vargo Bhavatiti Yeta Deva Katham. How can we say a squared plus b squared to which 2 a b is added or subtracted will lead to a plus b whole square or a minus b whole square? Is there a way of understanding this? Kvachit darshanam to aprayojakam. If we just show some examples of this, that is not really good enough. Anyatha. Otherwise, chatur guno rashi ghato yuti vargo bhavati tyapi suvacham. Otherwise, 4 times the product of 2 numbers is equal to the square of the sum of these numbers is also sounds like a proper or a valid result. So, he gives 3 4 examples 2 into 2 is 4, 4 into 4 is 16, this is also equal to the square of 2 plus 2. Similarly, 3 into 3 is 9, 4 times 9 is 36, this is also the square of 3 plus 3 and again go on 4 into 4 is 16, 4 times this is 64. So, he is saying why do not we say 4 x y is equal to x plus y whole square. Even this appears quite all right, because of these examples 4 into 2 into 2 is equal to 2 plus 2 whole square, 4 into 3 into 3 is equal to 3 plus 3 whole square and actually you can go on we can give infinite number of examples and therefore, we can conclude that this is correct. Thus, math Kvachit darshakam, kvachit darshanam aprayojakam, kvachit vyabhicharasya api sambhavat. So, verifying some result in a certain number of cases is not really of any great use, because there might be a contrary in sense. So, the moment I go to 2 into 3, I will find 4 into 2 into 3 is not equal to 2 plus 3 whole square. So, this is vyabhichara, this is a counter example or a deviation from what you are ataha varga yogo vigna gata yutono yuti vargo antara vargascha bhavatiti atra yuktihi vaktavya iti chet satyam. Therefore, if one says that one should really give a proof for the fact for the claim that is being made that x plus y whole square is equal to x square plus 2 x y plus, plus y square. It is indeed true that one needs to prove such a result. We will give this proof in the end of the Ekavarna Madhya Maharana. So, this is basically the translation of the same passage. So, what I am trying to say is that this fact that results in mathematics need to be justified. Uh, merely giving examples to support them is not enough. In mathematics, a certain amount of demonstration is needed, is a well known thing to mathematicians in India. <coughs> So, one of the earliest uh, discussion of nature of Upapattis occurs in the Bhaskaravan's commentary of Aryabhatiya. 
he is referring to uh, the discussion of uh, Aryabhatta that uh, the approximate value of square uh, the ratio of circumference to diameter is uh, 62832 by 20000. So, then he is saying that the approximate value is being given because the exact value cannot be given. Even Bhaskara one is saying that the exact value of pi cannot be given. Then he raises the question evam manyante sa upai eva nasti yena sukshma paridhi aniyate nanu chayam asti vishkambha varga dasha guna karini vrittasya parinaho bhavati. It is the corresponding uh, prakrita version of that. <coughs> so, the square root of 10 is really the accurate value of the circumference of a circle of diameter 1. Is not it true? So, why are you saying that a exact value of the ratio of circumference to diameter cannot be given? So, then Bhaskara says atrapi kevala evagamaha mai vopapatihi. So, here also what has been given is only a traditional statement, no justification has been provided. Rupa vishkambhasya dashakaranyaha paridhiriti. Atha manyante pratyakshenaiva pramiyamano rupa vishkambhakshetrasya paridhi dashakaranyahaiti. Why are you saying that? Why do not you measure the circumference and immediately conclude that it is square root of 10? Naitat, this is not possible. Aparibhashita pramanatvat karanina. Square root of 10 is a karani, it is an inexact quantity. One cannot really determine its exact value. So, like that, he goes on to give an argument that indeed one has to provide a proof for the fact that certain amount is this ratio of circumference to the diameter. So, so the fact that the mathematical result need to be demonstrated is fairly clear in the commentaries. Now, the book that gives a set of demonstrations, how does it view what these demonstrations are supposed to do? So, in Siddhanta Shiromani, in the Gola Adhyaya, while beginning, Bhaskara tells us what upapatti is, the word for proofs. Yukti, upapatti are the two words used for proofs in Indian mathematics. So, what these upapattis are supposed to do? <coughs> so, this verse, Madhyadhyam, Jusadam, Yadatra Ganitam, Tasya upapatti mina, Praudhim, Praudha Sabasu, Naiti Ganakaha, Nisam Shayona Swayam. I quoted this in the introductory lecture also that. But for whatever that has been discussed in this uh, Grahaganita section of astronomy, starting from the Madhyamadikara is the first chapter of the Grahaganita section of astronomy. So, whatever is discussed without proofs, without upapatti, Ganakaha, a mathematician, proud him, proudha sabasi naiti, proudha sabasu, he will not be considered as a scholarly mathematician in a, an assembly of scholarly mathematicians. Nisam shayon asvayam, he will not be free of doubts about the methods and procedures and the results that he is dealing with. So, these are the two kinds of handicaps that somebody who does not know proofs will automatically face. The same thing is repeated by Ganesh Daivagnya while starting his commentary on Lilavati, the commentary Buddhi Vilasini, which has a lot of upapattis. Vyakte va vyakta sange yadudita makhilam no papattim vinatat in both vyakta ganita and in abhyakta ganita that is both in arithmetic and geometry and in also in algebra. Whatever is said without upapatti nirbhranto varuteta suganaka sadasi pravdhatam naiti chayam that one will not be considered as a well versed mathematician in an assembly of good mathematicians nirbhranto va nor will he be without the confusion about the results and procedure. So, this is the kind of uh, focus that has been put on upapattis in Indian mathematics. Uh, upapattis are important, they need to be given and main purpose is to see that the rest of the mathematicians accept the argument that you are given. So, the result becomes uh, a valid result in the community in the community of mathematicians and it will enable you to be free of how to perform the particular operation or particular result or the particular procedure. So, that also a proof will enable, without the proof there may be so many confusions about what that original rule is meaning. But now, this is very very different, I mean if you see the first chapter of the famous commentary of Proclus on Euclid's uh, elements, you will see what proof is supposed to do. The proof is supposed to do a very unambiguous and irrefutable demonstration of the result stated by the text. That it has to once and for all establish 
in an uncontestable manner the truth of the proposition stated in the text. So, that is a very different ideal that does not find a central focus in the discussion of the Indian mathematicians. Now, how do they actually prove results? So, what, what does Bhaskara say about these proofs? Uh, in the Bijaganita Vasana, Bhaskara gives a proof of this Pythagoras theorem or the Bhuja Koti Karna Nyaya. And he says, there are two kinds of ways in which you can prove Kshetragata, Rashigata. Kshetragata is geometrical, Rashigata is algebraic. Tatra Kshetragata Chete. So, first I will explain the geometrical. Then after some time he says, Atra Rashigata Upavati Uchete. So, then he will give the algebraic. Sabi Kshetra Mula Antar Bhuta. That is also based upon geometry only. Yameva Kriya Purva Charya Hi Sankshipta Pathena Nibadha. So, this Upapati is something which has been passed down by tradition, by the oral tradition of teaching by uh, generation to generation. And of course, he says the geometrical proof is somewhat more complex for them, the algebraic proof is to be given. <coughs> so, let us see what is the geometrical proof and the algebraic proof that the Bhaskara gives for the Bhuja Koti Karna Nyaya. <coughs> so, the, the problem is that in a right angle triangle with sides 15 and 20, what is the hypotenuse? Tithi nakai hi tulye, 15, tithi nakai is 20. Kash ruti, what is the hypotenuse? Upapatishya rudhasya ganita siyasya kathyatam. So, give us also the traditional method of uh, proof or the traditional proof for this traditional method of calculation. So, this is the way Bhaskar is explaining, let us not go into the details here, it can be read. Basically, all that Bhaskara is doing is drop this perpendicular, you want to calculate this hypotenuse. The basic, this is the right angle of the right angle triangle. So, this right angle triangle itself is similar to each of these sub triangles that you obtain. So, you use the similar triangles and obtain both these abadhas, this side and this side. So, the abadha this side will turn out to be 225 by ya. If this ya is the length of this hypotenuse, the abadha on this side is 400 by ya, square of this by this. So, the hypotenuse itself is the sum of the two and so you will calculate the base to be 25. This is the essence of the geometrical proof given by Bhaskara and the argument goes like this using the Trirashika, basically the principle of similar triangles. Now, then he says, let me give the algebraic demonstration. And as he himself said, the algebraic demonstration is also based upon the figure. After all, you are proving a result in geometry. The algebraic demonstration is also based upon the figures. And essentially, all that Bhaskara is doing is, if this is our right angle triangle, construct a square from the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle and put this right the put the hypotenuse of the right angle triangles in such a way that in the center, you are left with another smaller square. And so, essentially, what you are doing is, you are having this a minus b whole square <coughs> plus 2 a b is equal to a square plus b square. And this 2 a b is actually 4 times half a b. So, this is essentially the algebra. So, this is the algebraic relation that is used in proving. Here is a a minus b whole square. Each of these triangles is half a b. So, you have 4 times half a b and the sum of a minus b whole square plus 4 times half a b is equal to a square plus b square. Therefore, this larger square is actually equal to a square plus uh, a square plus b square. So, the hypotenuse square is equal to sum of the Bhuja square and Koti square. So, it is called algebraic because this algebraic identity is employed in proving this. So, from the Shulba Sutra times, algebra and geometry have closely intertwined in discovering an algebraic result and even in expressing an algebraic result, uh, a geometrical result, algebra is employed uh, uh, in a very crucial way. And geometrical arguments are also made to discover algebraic identities. Now, let us go to the proof of something else. Uh, the In Bhaskara's Bijaganita, the Kuttaka Adhyaya, there is a detailed discussion by Krishna Daivagnya of the 
justification of the Kutaka process. So, how does Krishna Daivagya justify the Kutaka process? So, what is the Kutaka procedure? That is for solving the equation A x plus c by b is equal to y. A, c and b are given integers, x and y are to be determined for integral values. That is the Kutaka problem. A is called the Bhajya, b is called the Bhajaka, c is called the Kshepa and x is called the Guna, y is called the Labdi. This is the, these are the technical terms for all these quantities in Kutaka. So, what does Krishna do? Krishna Daivigya first shows that x and y do not change if we factor all the three numbers a, b, c by the same factor. Then he shows that if a and b have a common factor, then the above equation will not have a solution unless c is also divisible by the same factor. This you already now know that the GCD of the coefficients of x and y should divide the kshepa, then only the Kutaka problem has a solution. <coughs> Then he gives a proof that the mutual division of A and B does lead to the greatest common divisor at uh, some stage. So, the so called Euclidean algorithm. So, the, you can see that there is a sequence of argument going on in Upapati like the way we do in proving any argument in mathematics that we are familiar with. <coughs> Krishna then gives a detailed justification of the Kuttaka method itself. Uh, what is the Kuttaka method involved? That you make a valley. And that is based upon a detailed analysis of the operations in reverse. This is called Vyastha Vidhi. So, at each stage, what Krishna shows is that the, you are obtaining solution for the Kuttaka problem for the successive pairs of reminders which appear when you divide A by B. So, when you are dividing A by B, <coughs> so some coefficient A naught will appear, A naught B. So, you will just get the first remainder, then you divide R 1. So, A 1 will appear, A 1 R 1, a remainder R 2 will appear. So, for each of these successive remainders, the Kutaka problem that you will appear, when you go up in the valley, you will be solving the problem with the success, the Kutaka problem with the successive remainders. That is what is Kuttana. The problem with A B is converted to problem with R 1 R 2, then problem with R 2 R 3 problem with R 4, R 5 and ultimately comes to very small reminders. So, you are either able to guess the solution or you can work out the solution. So, that is what Krishna is explaining and then he will also tell you if you have odd number of steps, you go in a particular way. If there is an even number of steps, you go in a particular way. So, the proof of each and every one of these is considered in detail. So, as an illustration, Krishna considers this equation 173 x plus 3 by 71 while making the argument, the illustration will run parallel. So, he will keep an illustration and make the argument. <coughs> so, in the mutual division of 173 and 71, the quotients are 2, 2, 3 and 2. The remainders are 31, 9, 4 and 1. So, when we do the reverse operation with valley 2, 2, 3, 2, 1 followed by the kshepa is 3 and put a 0 below that right in the end. So, Krishna shows that in the first level you get 6 and 3 as the labdi and guna in the valley when you clear the valley and they will satisfy the equation 9 into 3 minus 3 by 4 is equal to 6. So, the quantities involved here 9 and 4 are essentially the two reminders which appear here. In the next step you will have a Kuttaka problem solution with the two remainders 31 and 9. The next guna and labdi will solve the Kuttaka problem with these two reminders. And finally, you will get the solution for the Kutaka problem with 173 and 71. So, the reverse operation in Valli is essentially solutions with the Kutaka problem with the same with the reminders, successive reminders that appear here. This is at the crux of the argument in proving that the Kutaka procedure works. <coughs> now, we will come to another aspect of proof in Indian mathematics. This is an interesting philosophical issue which seems to be uh, operative here in Indian mathematical tradition. Most of you who would have seen uh, proofs in the standard geometry text might clearly be aware that one of the most commonly met with arguments is what is called the proof by contradiction. What is proof by contradiction? It is also called 
reductio and absurdum. What is that? So, whenever you want to prove a proposition, you assume that the opposite of that proposition to be true for the time being and then argue and obtain a result which is in contradiction either with what you have assumed or with any of the results that you have already proved or with any one of your starting postulates. Therefore, by assuming the contrary of what you want to prove to be true, you arrive at a contradiction and therefore, that the assumption that the contrary of what you wanted to be proved is not justified and therefore, the opposite of that, that is the proposition that you want to be proved has been proved by you. So, this kind of an argument is called Tarka in Indian logic, Indian logic is Nyaya Shastra. So, this kind of an argument is called Tarka <laughs> and such arguments do appear in Indian mathematical text in some simple context. So, I have taken the simplest of such arguments to show that a negative number does not have a square. So, this is the argument of Krishna Daivagya to show that a negative number does not have a square root. The argument is very simple. Assume that a positive number is a square root of negative number, it cannot be square of that is positive. Assume a negative number to be square of a negative number that cannot be, its square is positive. So, there is really no number which you know which is the square root of a negative number. Therefore, a negative number does not have square. This is a standard argument of proof by contradiction and this is employed. So, nanu runa kaha kuto vargo na bhavati nahi raja nirdesha. Why is it that a negative number is not a square? It is not a royal fiat. Satyam. Runaankam vargam vadata bhavata kasya sa vargahiti bhaktavyam. You who are arguing that a negative number is a square, you should tell me whose square it is. It cannot be a square of positive number because of the rule samad vighatohi varga because square of a positive number is positive. Napi rinang kasya, it cannot be square of a negative number. Tatrapi swamad ighat artam rinangke na rinangke gunite dhaname vargo bhave. They are also negative, negative is positive. It yuktatvat yevam sati, that being the case, kathamepi tamankam na pashyamo yasya varga ha kshayo bhave. So, we are not able to see that number whose square is negative. So, it is a standard, <coughs> but while this kind of an argument is commonly used, you do not see an argument in any of the Indian mathematical texts, at least I have not seen one, where you are proving the existence of something, say the Chakravala process. It would be fairly easy for people to construct a proof where by assuming that the Chakravala process does not lead to a solution you come up with a contradiction of something that you already know and therefore, you say you have proved that the Chakravala process leads to a solution. Or, so, to prove the existence of some quantity which is uh, uh, by uh, proof of contradiction is not something that is commonly met with and I am trying to tell you that this is fairly in tune with the larger principles of Indian logic, the way or Indian philosophy. This Tarka while it is useful, in fact, Tarka is used in, uh, in the what is called in a, as a sieve in Anumana Pramana, that when you want to establish the an invariable concomitance Vyapti between uh, some Hetu and a Sadhya, you try to refine that Hetu further and further by the use of Tarka argument, that this Hetu may not really be giving to that Sadhya. People who know Indian logic will see that that is the context in which Tarka is used. So, Tarka is used as an auxiliary way of arguing. It is not given a status of an independent pramana. What does that mean? That anything that is established by Tarka, which in principle cannot be established through the other direct means of uh, verification, will not be given a state of valid, valid, validly established result. So, it is not an independent pramana, it is only as an aid to other pramanas. So, basically the Indian mathematicians seem to be using reductio ad absurdum, reductio ad absurdum kind of arguments, if at all they use, which are very few, far in between, mainly to show the non-existence or impossibility of certain things. They do not seem to have used it at all to show the existence of quantities, which existence is not possible to be demonstrated by via other means. That if you already know what the solution is, you do not need the reductio ad absurdum. In the morning, a question came in to uh, discuss the way Archimedes proved. The argument 
that the infinite series 1 by 4 plus 1 by 4 square etcetera adds up to 1 by 3. This was in a specific geometrical context in a geometrical construction. So, what Archimedes is showing is let me assume that the sum of all these figures is larger than that other figure, then he will show a contradiction. Let me show that the sum of all these figures is smaller than that sum and then he shows a contradiction. This is a very, very this is called the double reduction ad absurdum argument that this sum can neither be larger nor it be smaller and therefore, it has to be equal. Whereas, you show by successive smaller and uh, difference between the result that you want to prove and the successive terms uh, of summation become smaller and smaller and you are actually going to result that uh, to the result that you are wanting. So, that is the kind of proofs that uh, you find in Indian text. There is in fact, an even larger principle in Indian logic. It is that you do not grant validity to validity to any scheme of inference, where a premise which is already known to be false is used to arrive at a conclusion. And furthermore, you do not allow in uh, any in any discourse which is logically considered rigorous uh, terms which you know are empty terms which are meaningless like a square circle or a <coughs> rabbit's horn is the one that is very commonly used shasha shringa. The insistence on not using this uh, unrefer unreferentiated or undenotable terms is so deep that one is willing to even accept a contradiction rather than use these terms. So, this is the major issue, uh, this is a summary, the original work has a detailed discussion which is found in Udayana's Atma Tattva Viveka or you can pick up Udayana's Atma Tattva Viveka and see this discussion. The discussion is very simple, the Nayayika is saying you should not use any statement which uses fictitious entity uh, is not a valid statement. So, then the opponent asks you have already made a statement using a fictitious entity. So, what are you talking about? So, he says I am saying something meaningful if you do not want to understand it that is all right, but I will live with this contradiction of uh, not using fictitious entities in my discourse, but I will not allow still the fictitious entities to be used. So, we are willing to live with the contradiction that uh, the contradiction is in the statement that rules out the use of these fictitious entities. So, that contradiction is all right rather than using these fictitious entities in the argument. Now, this issue of contradiction is uh, very special in traditions which base all their arguments on reductio ad absurdum techniques. Because what are reductio ad absurdum? The moment you find a contradiction, the opposite of the premise is true. And the moment your logical system has a contradiction, all proposition becomes valid. In, in a logical system, where a proposition p and not p are both true, then from p and not p, you can imply any q and this is always a universally valid proposition. So, this, this uh, systems of logic which use this kind of reductio ad absurdum to the sort of limit, they are always worried about contradictions in their systems of logic. Okay, now, with that uh, interlude, let us come to Yukti Bhasha, uh, the discussion of proofs contained in Yukti Bhasha. <laughs> Today, I will just give, Andrew, yes ma'am. So, can you please give the etymology of the word Upapatti uh -huh. and can you tell us what is the difference between Upapatti and Pramana? Ah, pramana is a means of acquiring valid knowledge. So, Prama is valid knowledge, Prama Karana is Pramana, that what leads you to valid knowledge is pramana. So, the means of valid knowledge are in ordinary understanding, observation, pratyaksha, argument and generalization from known observation etcetera that is called anumana. Then sub differences, then what is called established, well established tradition that is agama. Then different schools of philosophy have their own other definitions of pramana, upamana and uh, arthapati and there are other kinds of pramanas. This is what is pramana in simple terms. Now, Upapati is Upapadyate, detailed uh, derivation of that uh, we will leave it to the lecture of Professor Ram Subramanian that you are going and arriving at the, you have established the result or you are arriving at the result. So, that is, uh, I mean a loose sense of QED.
<laughs> so, <laughs> the most detailed exposition of Upapadis in Indian mathematics is found in Yukti Bhasha of Jeshtra Deva. So, Jeshtra Deva says the present is to, the purpose is to present the rationales uh, of the results and procedures outlined in Tantra Sangraha. Many of these are given in Sanskrit also in the works of Shankara Varyar. Yukti Bhasha has 15 chapters. The first five mathematics chapters deal with numbers, logistics, fractions, rule of three and solutions of indeterminate equation. The chapter 6 and 7 of the mathematics part are the crucial ones. Chapter 6 deals with the Paridhi Vyasa Sambandha. It presents the derivation of Madhava series for pi, derivation of binomial series, the derivation of this estimate of the sum 1 to the power k etcetera plus n to the power k for large n and then derivation of the end correction terms and the transformed series. Chapter 7 deals with the jnana or computation of R signs. It presents a derivation of the second order interpolation formula of Madhava. I think that will be covered in one of the trigonometry talks. This is followed by derivation of the Madhava series for R sign and R word sign. In the end, it has a dis detailed discussion of cyclic quadrilaterals and also the proof of surface area and volume of a sphere. The astronomy part has seven chapters, which gives detailed demonstration of all the results of spherical astronomy. Perhaps you will get a glimpse of <coughs> the way Indians, the sophisticated way the Kerala uh, astronomers work with the spherical uh, trigonometry in one of the lectures that will follow. <coughs> so, first is the Yukti Bhasha proof of Bhuja Koti Karnanyaya. <coughs> so, we saw two proofs of Bhaskara. This is the proof of Yukti Bhasha, <coughs> very simple. This is one square A B C D uh, B P Q R. This is the Koti square, A B C D is the Bhuja square. Assume that Bhuja is smaller. Now, make your A m is equal to Koti. So, your m p will be equal to Bhuja, that is, mark this point m such that m p is the same as A b. Then join m p, join m d, construct the square on m d. Now, the constructing the square on m d, this procedure is similar to the Shulba Sutra procedure for adding two squares as it was pointed out in the lecture on Shulva Sutras. Then, how to show that this square, this m d square is equal to a m square plus a d square, very simple. At the point d, uh, cut this triangle a m d and place it on d c t and at the point q, cut this triangle m p q, rotate it and place it on q r t. Then, you have shown that this square is equal to the sum of those two other squares. So, actually it involves cutting and repasting. So, this was another feature of all the Indian uh, mathematical arguments that they could involve movement of the physical objects, cutting of the object. Then even uh, many of the proofs say I mentioned Krishna Daivagya's proof of minus into minus is plus by using that let uh, the direction of moving eastwards be taken as positive direction of moving westwards be taken as negative and with that we will be able to show that plus 5 minus of minus 3 is equal to plus 8 and things like that. So, even physical arguments of various kinds are acceptable as proofs as long as one is systematic and one is explained. Surprisingly, uh, I should mention that this proof which is available in the available editions of Yukti Bhasha is different from the proof Charles Wish has given in his paper saying that this is the proof that I have found in Yukti Bhasha. So, that still remains a mystery. Now, there is another complex geometrical uh, proof that you find in Yukti Bhasha. This is the method of approximating the circumference of a circle by a, a square which is uh, circumscribing it and then dividing the square in such a way that you have a uh, regular octagon then dividing it in such a way such that a, you have a regular polygon of 16 sides. Again Kriya Kramakari gives a collection of verses due to Madhava which seem to be explaining this method. So, Madhava who gave the infinite series also has summarized this method which is the classic old method of 
trying to estimate the circumference of a circle by the sides, summing the sides of an inscribed or a circumscribed polygon with large enough number of sides. So, the method is as given in Yukti Bhasha is like this, you take this square which is one fourth of the square which is actually circumscribing the circle. So, the side of this particular square is right now these are this is r, but the bigger square which is circumscribing the circle has side 2 r. Now, the point at which O A 1 meets C 1, Yukti Bhasha says draw this line A 2 C 1 B 2 which is parallel to E s east south direction. So, instead of saying draw the tangent which they do not say this is the way they are explaining. And then it says okay, it goes and meets this side E A 1 A 2 join O A 2. <coughs> then this O A 2 meets at the point C 2. Now, draw A 3 C 2 B 3 which is parallel to C 1 E and like that you go on. So, this E A 2 will be the side of a circumscribing octagon, E A 3 will be a side of a circumscribing polygon of 16 sides. So, this complex geometrical arguments are indeed dealt with in Yukti Bhasha. Now, the rest of the argument is using right angle triangles and similar triangles estimating E A 2, E A 3. So, E A 1 is the half of the side of the circumscribing square, E A 2 is half of the E A 1 is half the side of the circumscribing square, E A 2 is half the side of the circumscribing octagon, octagon will look like this. Here the octagon, this is the part of the octagon, it will go like that. So, this is half of the side of the circumscribing octagon, E A 3 is half the side of the circumscribing 16 sided polygon. The corresponding karana, karanas are O A 2, O A 1, O A 3. So, the corresponding karanas are denoted by K 1, K 2, K 3. The corresponding abhadas, the abhadas are the intercepts D 1 A 1, D 2 A 2, D 3 A 3. When you have the first one, this D 2 A 2, D 1 A 1 will be the abadha that is in this right angle triangle, D 2 A 2 will be the abadha in this triangle and similarly, D 3 is not shown there. So, those are the abadhas which will come handy in doing this calculation, they were given by the following. Then you have a series of recurrence relations that you see which are derived from the geometrical argument. So, L 2, K 2 and A 2 can be de defined or determined in terms of L 1, K 1 and so first L 2 is determined in terms of L 1, K, K 1 and A 1, then K 2 is determined, then A 2 is determined. So, L 2, K 2, A 2 is determined, then you go on determine the side of the regular hexagon. So, given L n, K n, A n, L n plus 1, K n plus 1, A n plus 1 can be determined and in fact, if you study the process, the recurrence relation seems to be something like this and initial value L 1 is r itself half the side of circumscribing square, L 2 will be root 2 minus 1 into r and so on. So, you keep on using this relation, you will obtain half the side of circumscribing polygon of larger and larger side and from that you find out the circumference of the polygon, take it as an approximation to the circumference of the square and Kriya Kamakari says, evam yavadabhishtam sukshmatam apadaitum shakyam. You can go if you are like Al Kashi, you have patience, you can calculate pi to 16 decimal places, there is really no problem. So, I think uh, for today, I have covered the tradition of proofs in Indian mathematics uh, from more ancient times. In the next talk, I will discuss the proofs as found in Yukti Bhasha of the results of Madhava, uh, that will be tomorrow uh, on Monday.